out. So at any point now, this may go live. Apparently, we are live, so I'm going to stop showing people this boring screen, move over to Zoom, where we all work, get Juan up on the screen as well, which we promised we'd stick his photo over the top. So give me just a second for that. Otherwise, it's a bit like, who's this ghostly voice? And then we need to check with everybody that everybody can see in here. So good evening. Welcome to this live stream with Juan Linietsky, founder of Godot. Just want to make sure, firstly, that everybody can hear everybody. So in the chat, can you hear Ben? Say, hear Ben. And then Jan? Hi. Hi, Ben. Awesome. <laughs> and then the <laughs> final... About 30 seconds to get back to us, so... Um... <laughs> Awesome. I'm just going to stop something, which is me playing in the background, and just wait for them to come back to us. And then once they do that, we can crack into it. No point in going ahead until we know they can hear. So I mean, I'm afraid what, there's the, there's the uh, what is it, Yana? Toucan? It's a toucan. Yep, awesome. There's the toucan. Juan does not have a video camera on him at the moment, guys. So we are just putting a wonderful still image of him looking uh, friendly and content there on the screen. So as soon as we confirm that everybody can hear, then we'll dive uh, we in. We have confirmation from Draymond Jelly saying, ah, headset too loud, takes heartbeat check. So yeah, I think we're good. And then Baz, great. Fantastic. All right, everybody, good evening and welcome. Juan, thank you very much for being here. Really, really pleased that you dived on. I'm super grateful. So um, if you could you just briefly tell us, maybe just take straight, straight into the story. Um, what did you do before you created Godova? If you're, it was your life story in a nutshell before, before all this happened. Uh, well, it's it's been a long well, it's been a long time since then. Uh, I'm like uh, in, in that generation that people doesn't quite uh, hit yet. That I'm not like Generation X or Millennial. You know, people that was born in the late seventies and early eighties. Uh, mm -hmm. So I got to play the Commodore sixty four games and everything. So uh, I used to go to uh, public school here in Buenos Aires. Uh, so. That means only going in the morning, uh, so I only went to school in the morning, and since my parents wanted me to do something else in the afternoon, they sent me to learn uh, stuff <laughs> every every afternoon, something different, like I play football uh, one day, another day, just uh, learn piano, and the other, just, uh, they, they found this thing about learning programming, and I went to learn programming, I was like eight year, nine, eight or nine years old. Uh, I'm, go I'm going to learn like logo. Uh, you, you remember the turtle? You have. Oh the, yeah. Yeah, you could move the turtle like forward or left or uh, things like that. Uh, so I, I, I had a little fun with that, and then I wondered how can I make my my own games with with the turtle, and that wasn't that easy. So uh, I asked my parents, and I just uh, got a, a Commodore 64. I think uh, it was. I think it was 128, but. Nobody used it as 128, so it was Commodore 64 pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and I learned after a while the assembly for the for the Commodore for the Commodore, which maybe for somebody who was like 11 or 12 years old was probably uh, early age. But that's the only thing I could uh, find to make games. And I asked the adults around, and they helped me, which was pretty cool. Uh, so uh, then I got a personal computer, uh, a, a PC, uh, and uh, then I learned. Uh, x85 uh, assembly uh, and some c and pascal and I, I got very interested in making games since i was really really young okay. uh, the thing is that where i live uh, uh, down here there was no game industry so the, there's no no way you can dream of working on the game industry when there's no game industry where you live uh, and to so be clear that's in that's in argentina right yeah yeah and I just want to take a quick minute right there. Apparently Juan and myself are quite quiet and Ben is very loud. Okay, so I've moved the microphone and turned you guys up uh, three or four. If we get some feedback on if that's good, that'd be great. Okay, so sorry, Juan, take it away. And for, oh, cha sorry, and for chat, Jan, use, use Slack. Got it. Oh, so, well, basically uh, I started making games and I got together with other kids. Uh, well, not so much kids, more like eight. When I was 17 or 18, I got together with other guys who wanted to make games. Uh, and we dreamed of making some kind of game industry down here, uh, which was uh, something kind of crazy. But in the end, after a few years, we managed to to get investment to start a, a company, which was called NGD Studio back in two thousand and one, I think. What was the name again? Uh, what was the name again? It was called NGD Studios. Uh, we founded that company. Uh, so we were like the kids that wanted to make an MMO, uh, but we were like way before the the time kids wanted to make MMOs, like they didn't exist yet. So uh, 
we just started in investment and started working on one. And in the end, I think it, it came out, which is cool because uh, you usually advise people to just don't make an MMO uh, as your first project. That one kind of works. Uh, well, but I, I left well the company quite early uh, afterwards. Uh, but when I worked on that, the interesting thing was that Unreal Engine was like half a million dollars or something to license. You can imagine that we didn't have any kind of technology to make games back then. Uh, there wasn't any engine you can license or anything. So I, I had to learn how to make game engines from scratch. Uh, and added to that uh, with a very low budget, uh, because we didn't have any kind of crazy budget companies in the US or Europe have to make games. So that's kind of how we started making tools for making games. I never, almost never programmed games. I only made tools for other people. Uh, so basically what, what happened is that uh, me and, and this guy that worked with me, Ariel, uh, Ariel Mansour, but back then, this is like almost 20 years ago, <laughs> uh, started making tools to make our own games and then started licensing our tools to other companies here in South America. Uh, and like, 10 years or more, we just licensed the tools uh, and they made a lot of games and a lot of games were published with, with those tools. Uh, so you, you kind of fast forward to 2012 and to 2013 and then engines like Unity start getting more popular and more people they realize that are, there are easy to use tools to make games. Uh, and uh, by the time we had like a lot of code that we used to make a lot of games that were a lot of tools that were pretty easy to use at the time. Uh, so what we were thinking is uh, this takes a lot of effort to make, but it's quite cool to use. Uh, if you, you probably have realized that when you uh, have been like learning a lot and the way it works is pretty different to the other engines, it doesn't have like the same uh, architecture or, or this entity component thing. Uh, since uh, we worked a lot in uh, like enterprise software and everything, we, we came with our own mindset to, to make a technology. So if you look at Godot, it's, it's a lot more similar to like QT or other more uh, enterprise tools. Uh, probably this is what, what makes it pretty easy to use, I guess. Uh, but uh, in the end, it was like, we just made it open source to, so other people could contribute or anything because it was very different to what was in there. And we believe that people that used it found it easy to use and easier to learn. Uh, even though it was very raw uh, at the time, uh, but then, it, it seems people liked it, I guess, after a few years. That that was a, quite a surprise. Now people compare it to Unity and everything, and it's quite cool because that wasn't really the, the idea when we open sourced it, but, but it's quite cool, I guess. So that, that, that kind of is the short version of the story. We're having people uh, wondering where your webcam is, and we've had a suggestion that I shake your image so it looks like you're alive. So I'm just uh, in a very perfect <laughs> right. animator sort of way. I'm uh, just sorry, uh, I don't really have a webcam, and, and also I got a really bad cold. I was with fever and everything the past days. That didn't stop me from completing the new animation system because I have the habit of uh, programming even more when, when, I have, when I'm sick, so it's like... Uh, uh, <laughs> I am really looking forward to that new animation system. It looks amazing. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Yes. Thank you, Juan. So uh, wh wh what were you doing and how old were you when you, when you actually kicked this thing off? In? So what were you doing and how old were you when you when you started on when you first when you first released the engine in the in the form it is today as like the first version that you would call Godot? Uh, I, we actually we made many engine versions for different projects. The nice thing about uh, we being consultants is that every time we made a game with the engine, we could like be very uh, like self critics about ourselves uh, on another project and like hey this didn't really work so well. Uh, this, this could be changed. Uh, so we, we could like rewrite the engine almost from scratch for every project. Uh, for every premium project, we would maybe take uh, two or three months uh, before the project rewriting the whole engine again. Mm -hmm. uh, and this happened many, many times, uh, maybe four or five times or something like that. So the, the, the architecture and the core of the engine uh, are uh, very, very polished. Uh, we're very polished when we released it as, as open source. It, it maybe lacked like a lot of features. Uh, it, it had a very very strong to uh, the engine, but so far the 3D engine was really old, uh, and a lot of systems in the engine were also really old. Uh, so th that's kind of the state it was when we released it. 
Uh, but the architecture was actually, I think, uh, very polished in that sense. That, that's why I think people liked it. But uh, if you look at it uh, from four years ago and what is now, it's completely different, I think. Awesome. Thank you, Juan. And I'm getting a sore arm here from animating your face. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to time the, I would love to see it later. I'm trying to time the jiggles of my mouse, but the problem is it's making my desk shake. So we're all shaking here. Um, we do have comments like shaking camera is great. The shaking .jpg is better than camera. Nice. Yeah, that's hard. So, <laughs> um, Juan, here's a really good question. How does the founder of the engine pronounce the engine? I don't really know. That that's that also got me by surprise. Uh, because uh, in Spanish it's, it's, it's esperando a Godot, which is completely like we, we don't pronounce you don't we don't have pronunciations in Spanish like you yeah. speak the way you read, so there isn't really any pronunciation. Uh, and then when the engine went up in search, uh, people started asking how do you pronounce it and I was like, I don't know, just like the play, I guess. <laughs> Uh, and that wasn't a good answer. It, it seems because it, the play is different in every language, and yeah. uh, and even it seems uh, you can. It, it's very funny because you can see now the play on YouTube in many languages and everything, and different dialects, and it's, it's a very known play, I guess. But uh, I don't really even know how to pronounce it myself in English. Uh, I know ah. how to say it in Spanish, and the French guys know how to say it in French because I think it's a French name. Gudo. Uh, on that, it's. <laughs> Everyone else, it's whatever they like, I guess. Which is what we've been saying. You, if you want to say Godot, say Godot. If you want to say Godot, say Godot. If you want to say Godot, it's up to you. Okay. Uh, speaking of questions, we had one earlier from uh, Who Cares? That's the name. That's, uh, <laughs> will Godot move from GitHub? If not, will you accept MR from GitHub or other Git repositories? And Jan, if you could move your microphone just about four or five inches further away from you, just to balance out our audio a little bit, that would be awesome. So I think this is off the back of the news that Microsoft is uh, is expanding to GitHub. Are you planning on staying on GitHub for now? I know Remy has answered this on Facebook, but people are asking. Jan, did you hear that? No, could you move your microphone? I, a I little think, bit? I think so far uh, the question is more about whether. Uh, we want to do self-hosting or use a proprietary platform for hosting. Uh, not, not so much which platform. Uh, I did a few open source projects in the past for audio and stuff like that. And actually self-hosting a lot of platforms are quite a pain to use. So the nice thing about not hosting it yourself is that it, it, it's a lot less of a burden. Yeah. So if, if you decide to not host it yourself and you're going to host on a proprietary platform, then it doesn't really matter, I think, where, where it's hosted whether it's GitLab or GitHub or anything. I know you can just take GitLab projects offline and host it yourself in the worst case, but the, the idea is just to not do that because uh, it's it's a lot more of a hassle. At some point, you have to compromise usability uh, by from, from anything else because uh, so far, actually, we didn't even have any problem with GitHub. Uh, it just works. Uh, the, the workflow uh, working with GitHub is great. All the pull request workflow is amazing. Uh, I think they really changed how uh, open source projects uh, change it from uh, being like something run by like, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry I'm going to say this because I, I include myself in that definition. Like people that was more like, a, uh, like more, uh, how do you call it in English? Uh, uh, more like marginal uh, open source uh, hippies or something like that. I include myself on that definition yeah. uh, because I ran many projects in the past. Uh, it was more of a marginal way of doing development and uh, I think all these uh, social media sites uh, for doing development really did improve it and made it more massive. Uh, I don't think uh, we couldn't have had the amount of contributions and help for the project uh, if we weren't hosting on something like GitHub. Uh, you can see that very easily if you consider checking other projects, uh, including Blender, where it's more difficult for them, for people to get and contribute and do pull requests. Uh, I think this. Uh, the systems just make it much much easier. Uh, I think they have a lot of merit uh, on, on the way it works, uh, GitHub. Uh, so as long as we are not hosting ourselves, I don't think it really matters where we host it. Uh, and so far, GitHub really has worked pretty well. Yeah. Added to that, uh, the GitHub guys uh, really uh, always have a really nice attitude uh, towards the project. Uh, you probably have to think that uh, letting aside maybe Phaser, uh, we are the most popular game-related uh, project uh, on, on the site. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, we are probably also catching up to Phaser at this point. We, we were like catching up to like first the GDX, then Cocos, and now Phaser. They're just slowly becoming the most uh, popular project on GitHub related to video games and game development. Uh, we're like second place now, but uh, well, we are like on the upwards trend, I guess. So uh, GitHub understands this, and they really did uh, help us a lot uh, as to promote ourselves as a, as a success case on their platform. We when was uh, GDC this year? Mm-hmm. Uh, they borrowed us their, their place to do a, a product meeting, and their place was amazing. They even invited pizzas for everyone. They really had a really nice attitude toward the project. So we are very grateful to them. Uh, and added to that, now, now Microsoft has acquired GitHub. Uh, mm-hmm. I also have to add that Microsoft themselves have a really nice uh, attitude towards the project. They are financing the C-Sharp support. Uh, they are doing donations. We have a really good relationship with them. Uh, so I, I don't think there is any reason uh, to change course on what we're doing now. Uh, I think for the benefit of the project uh, as a whole, it's better to keep on the course. Uh, I wouldn't really even think that uh, there is a, a benefit for the project uh, in not continuing on Bitcoin and GitHub. It, it's pretty much the opposite. Yeah. So I think that pretty much should should answer the question. Uh, uh- we. They actually, if you think about it in terms of, of benefit, uh, the the way that GitHub was monetized uh, their their platform is selling private services uh, to companies that want to to host uh, on GitHub private. Uh, this probably is going to be uh, deepened by the Microsoft purchase. I think uh, the micro, Microsoft is going to use GitHub to serve services to companies for hosting their repositories. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have a pretty good success case and success story to tell for them, which is a huge project with hundreds, uh, almost thousands of contributors, uh, which works really well on their platform. Uh, so I think we can keep uh, using this synergy working together with them to keep benefiting a lot. Uh, I, I am, I guess, like uh, thinking that uh, we should go like self-hosting and everything and don't uh, work with corporations because uh, the project is uh, is has, gets more benefits for, by working with them and, and it's not the opposite thing. Awesome. Yeah, that makes sense. I think a lot of people react badly whenever they hear the word Microsoft because that's just what we've done for 20 years. Like I think people are still reacting like it's 1990 something. No, I, I agree that uh, Microsoft had really uh, bad behaviors in the past towards open source, like bad mouthing and everything. But uh, I think the the new Microsoft with Satya Nadella uh, is completely mm. different than the one with the Steve Malmer. It's a completely different, completely different company. But even with that, uh, when I used to work, uh, I used to have companies and work for companies in the past dealing with Microsoft in everything regarding like publishing or console development or everything, they were always a very easy to approach company and it's very easy to find like, the person you need to talk to and. They are a very uh, nice company to work with if you let aside uh, your belief and, and everything with that. Uh, if you compare to other companies, uh, of, of, of the, the other big companies, uh, we, if we have a lot more difficulty, like, for example, reaching people from Google and things like that. Microsoft has always been very uh, approachable and easy to work with. So I honestly not only have uh, anything against them at this point, but I think it's good that we keep working with them. I think that's fair. There's a follow-up question. Um, okay, you're not moving, and that's fair. Will you accept merge requests from repos that are not hosted by GitHub or hosted on GitHub? Uh, probably not, because it's just more of a hassle for the core developers. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know, really. Just make an anonymous account on GitHub and, and do a request if you don't want to like uh, have your information given to the company. Uh, there's many developers in the past that did this. Uh, they just used an anonymous account or something like that. GitHub doesn't really have much of a problem with that. Uh, it's not like Facebook that will ask you for your phone number or anything like that to set up an account. So right. I, I think it's not really a problem. Many contributors are doing this already, so I, that, that shouldn't be a problem. Fair enough. Okay, let's see. I got another question. This one's from Andy Jeffrey. What is hard there? Sorry, I massacred your name there. What is Juan's favorite Godot game or project? Do you have a favorite game or project out there? Let's see some favoritism. Oh, that's <laughs> difficult. Uh, I, I like the projects I, I worked with it when 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 I had my own company. Uh, that those are pretty were pretty fun to do. Uh, Good answer. Uh, from the project the community is working, uh, I was completely surprised to see the, the huge amount of projects submitted like in March or February when we asked for 
for them to make the the, the show reel that we yeah. like the, the GDC. Uh, if you compare to the game submitted like two years ago when people was barely starting to hear about the dot, uh, there was very few projects. A few were nice, but mostly very very beginner projects. And mm. now you see a lot of very nice major projects with a lot of quality. Uh, the quality bar is also pretty high from the projects that are sent by people using Godot, which probably shows that the engine allows you to make like free complex and nice uh, looking stuff without uh, taking so much time like uh, understanding it and things like that. Uh, so most of them really look amazing. Uh, I don't really have a personal favorite of them. Uh, That's fair. Most actually look great. Uh, what, what I hope is that uh, more of them get to be completed and published because uh, what Godot needs the most now is uh, something we can't do, which is uh, publish projects uh, that show that you can make complex games with it. Yeah. Uh, so the best that the community can do right now is uh, publish projects with it and, and show the world that amazing things can be done with Godot at this point. No, I completely agree. I think the one thing it needs is visibility. I mean, that's kind of why we're doing this, right? It's why we want a big Kickstarter with lots of publicity is we want to get this thing out there. Um, Speaking of games coming out, you guys have a game jam coming. That's exciting. Oh, yeah. I'm not organizing this. This is Remy doing. Remy is doing. Uh, mm -hmm. doing most of the project management, and, and I'm, my focus is mainly development and helping all, other developers. Yeah. Uh, that I, I just can't do everything. It's, it's way too much time. <laughs> uh, it, like, I used to do consulting for companies until last year. Now, thanks to the Patreon, I, I, I stopped doing that, and my whole time is used to develop a lot. But uh, the problem is that most contributors work like on weekends and things like that. So I work all the week at home having features and then all the weekend helping people. Yeah. So I don't really have a lot of free time, I guess. So it's great that Remy is uh, also using his, his paid time as a project manager to do all this because it's so much work to coordinate everything the, the way he does that, that I think it's great that he can do it. Yep. I think that's great too. Uh, a lot of questions about individual games and so on. I'm going to leave those for a little bit. Uh, here's a question from me. Is there a feature of Godot that you're more proud of than anything else? In other words, what's your favorite thing about Godot? What's the favorite thing that you personally have put in? Mm, that's difficult. It's like I just keep adding features, and every new feature I add is my favorite <laughs> feature. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I, I think usually what, what I like is that uh, people really like the, the way the scene is uh, organized in Godot. Uh, usually see that as the best. When people ask about the lot, they usually say that it's, it's very easy to organize the project and the scene management is very easy. Uh, I, that's probably the, the most most thing I am proud of. Uh, it's not, I didn't invent that feature, as I mentioned. That yeah. This is something that comes, it's very common in enterprise software. You just go to Java world or something like that, and this way of thinking project is really common. Uh, it's just that in video games, uh, nobody really wants this route. Uh, if you even, I mean, I was for 20 years in the game industry, and you would talk to programmers that worked in really big companies and did uh, engine development in like Ubisoft and many big companies, and and they're like living in their own like world. They are mm -hmm. not very aware of uh, how the software world works outside video games, uh, uh, and you see people like trying to keep to kill uh, object orientation and things like that uh, because. Right. Uh, it's really kind of strange uh, when you have been in both sides of the fence uh, that you see people from the video game world like saying that things that have worked like fine for enterprise software, even high performance enterprise software mm -hmm. uh, for years. Uh, so I, I think probably the, the merit that, that Dota did, and this is why I like it the most, it just took a feature that was like totally common outside the game development yeah. environment into game development, and it shows that it can work. Uh, which is simple, like scene-based uh, scene orientation, uh, object orientation. That's fair. Uh, I got a question from uh, River Mesa, or River Mesa? I'm guessing River Mesa. Where do you see Godot heading in a year, in two years, and in three years? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, I think it depends mostly on, on community feedback. Uh, everything we have been doing now has been based on community feedback. Uh, when we released uh, Godot as open source, like in 2014, I think, uh, the biggest problem people had was uh, usability. Mm. Uh, it was like, I mean, when, when you make software, uh, I think people that really understand, uh, like, it's dif difficult to, to the di most difficult thing of making something like Godot is not really like writing the rendering or anything else. It's just mostly 
making sure people understand the, the, the usability and that kind of thing. That, that's by, by far the most difficult thing. Because you make, the, you make an application to use yourself, uh, you're going to use it the same way. But people come from other softwares and with other backgrounds, and they want you to do things different. And we didn't even have like right menu, uh, right button menus, menus or drag and drop and things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, this was fine. Like I came from using Blender and that kind of things, which don't have any of that, and it was fine. But people started asking for uh, in a lots of usability improvements. So up to Godot one point one, which took like a year and a half more to make. Uh, we just spent most of the time working on usability. Uh, then most users were making 2D games because the 3D engine was really old. Uh, so we focused on improving the 2D engine, I think, until Godot 2.0. Uh, only even 2.1, it was mostly 2D and usability. And, and people started complaining that 3D was really old and uh, we should probably make a 3D renderer and things like that. So Godot 3 was mostly work on the 3D renderer. Uh, mm -hmm. But at this time, we started having a lot of more contributors. So uh, more things happened at the same time. Uh, so the Godot 3.1 that is probably coming in a few months. Uh, we're trying to have an alpha for the end of the month. So I hope we make it. Uh, if not, it's probably going to be a week or two late. But it's going to be about that, that time. Uh, so the, the idea for that is mostly polish and finishing the features that we couldn't add for 3.1. Uh, I'm doing a lot of work on like rewriting the inspector and the, prop and the animation stuff uh, and adding the missing to the skeletons and things that were mostly things that we made, wanted to make for Godot 3, but as 3D had the priority over anything else, we just did, couldn't make them. Uh, so that, that was all the 2D list for 3 and we're just completing everything that was missing. Uh, and there's now a uh, George that's working on the typed GD script, which is probably going to be the biggest feature of the release. Uh, this is the first time there's a, a major release, and I don't make the biggest feature, so <laughs> I'm proud of that. Uh, and uh, and also the GLDS2 backport, uh, who's making Thomas is working on it. Those are probably made the main features of the of the new upcoming version. And then uh, from my side, I want to. Uh, do the port to Vulkan because obviously uh, after I met this GDC with many of the uh, representatives from companies like NVIDIA, AMD, and, and many others, uh, I got a very clear message that OpenGL is on the way out. Uh, yeah. It's going to be deprecated on, on Max now, which is that's uh, news for me, uh, even though for other people it was pretty obvious. Uh, and in general, what we have been seeing is that the, the quality of the drivers for OpenGL has been decreasing and not increasing. Uh, and for mobile, it's kind of the same. We made the OpenGL DS3 renderer because uh, we thought that it's going to run, this is going to run great on mobile and on desktop and everything. Uh, but the truth is that the quality of the drivers on mobile is really, really bad. And they don't really even care uh, about improving it for OpenGL DS3. So pre pretty much the the message is that OpenGL is on the way out, uh, and we should focus on having a GLDS2 renderer for very much compatibility, and then focus on Vulkan, which is like the future. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much the priority after 3.1 is out. Yeah, uh, which uh, does lead me to a question I know I'm about to be asked, so I'm going to beat everyone to it. When's 3.1 out? Uh, the alpha is going to be hopefully by the end of the month, maybe uh. one or two weeks late, but, but not no more than that. Uh, we're all working very hard uh, to, to achieve that. Uh, after that, it's probably going to be a month uh, of fixing all the issues that come out from, from Alpha. Uh, and then uh, I, I'm hoping like after Alpha is two months or at match three maybe for for the stable uh, 3.1, uh, but should be like much a much quicker uh, development cycle than 3.0, which was like a year and a half or something like that. Uh, this should hopefully be like half that time uh, at match. Well, so it should be much cool. quicker. Uh, I think that probably Godot 3.2 or Godot 4, I'm not sure, depending on how much people want to break some more compatibility, uh, that's going to be much quicker than Godot 3.1. Uh, also, don't, don't worry, it's not going to be like uh, the same as Godot 3. If we break compatibility, it's going to be very, very, very minimal things. Like the same when we went from Godot 1 to Godot, to Godot 2, which was like minimal. Uh, that's very small annoyances and things that, that need breaking compatibility, but projects should just work with like 15 minutes, you, you fix everything. 
from one version to the other, not not like from Godot 2.1 to Godot 3, which was probably takes a week or two to, to fix or even more. At that was so, much sooner than I was expecting. So I'm really glad I asked that. Yeah, it's it's uh, the main the main thing with that is that uh, there, there's uh, a lot of uh, many, many users that want changes that probably require breaking some very small bits of compatibility. So that may be Godot 4. I'm not sure yet. Uh, needs to be discussed because I, I don't just decide things on my own nowadays. Just need to like open a thread and, and discuss on GitHub for like months, like like always. But but usually good things come out of that. Uh, so after that, uh, actually I want at some point be able to uh, focus less on uh, on adding new features uh, because at some point it's going most of the big things is going to be there. I am estimating that by the next version, like B3.2 or 4.0, I think we're going to have pretty much like perfect feature parity with Unity and Unreal. So it's going to be like the same thing, like uh, with, with all the other engines. So the pressure to add new features, like there is now, for example, uh, rewriting all the animation system to support cinematics uh, or uh, fixing all the, the animation blending for trees and characters. Uh, which is a uh, like ten years old code that is now being rewriting because we want to support like uh, uh, new, those new features that people use for animation. Like uh, you, you can like write polygons to the blending that like in Unreal and things like that. Uh, we just want to like get those systems that were the missing ones more up to date. Uh, and then it's probably I, I, I all, all the time I see the small little details I would love to work with that I I can't. Uh, which is mostly polish and improving the general uh, user experience, uh, which is what I enjoy the most doing. Uh, so I hope that after uh, Godot, uh, whatever is out uh, the, after the, the, the next one, I, I personally and most of the developers can focus more on enjoying the overall experience for users as much as possible. Uh, like usability and uh, making the sport simpler and things like that. Uh, that, that's uh, because if you ask most users, they are fine with the level of features there is now. There, there's even less and less users that need, need the new features we are adding. So mm -hmm. at some point, we I think improving the user experience that is very important. And the other thing we want to do is uh, that we were discussing is uh, doing something more similar to what Blender does with the open movies, like trying to create a very very high quality demo content that you can use uh, to as a base to understand how to make like complex scenes uh, in both 2D and 3D, like animation rigs and things like that. Uh, that can go, of course, together with tutorials and things like that. But that show how much advanced you can, you can things you can do and how to how to make them. Uh, we're actually working on a new demo uh, for the 3.1. I hope to finish it by the end of the month. We're working with an artist that is pretty awesome. I already posted a few pics on Twitter, and I, I hope it's going to have more material by the end of the month. But it's looking really nice so far. Uh, it's going to also work great as a way to add more features to the engine, so you can see them mostly do a 3D engine. So yeah, I, I'm like hoping for a time, hopefully next year, uh, where uh, the focus is more improving uh, what is there rather than adding new features. Uh, we are doing both now, but having like the full like uh, team of contributors or, or most of them working on improving the experience, I think that that will probably be much much better for the product project overall than what we're doing now. Juan, looking at the team of contributors and the and the Patreon, um, I, I want to remind people that everybody involved in this is being paid through the community, right? So it's all community supported, uh, which you guys, you know, you guys have got to live and eat and you're doing an amazing thing. But I just want to thank everybody who who supports the Patreon. We support the Patreon at a very at a fairly low level, but in total, it's making what 8,100 a month or something now. Um, it's only a few hundred dollars a month now, 800 and something dollars a month short of your 9,000 goal. What will you be able to do when you get to the next goal, Juan, at 9,000? Uh, we still need to think about that and talk about it. Uh, it's uh, the way we are uh, financing contributors. Uh, you, there, we, but there's an article you can read on, on the Patreon site that explains uh, how we manage the financing and the hires and everything. Uh, there are more contributors that are uh, hired to do work on Godot than, than probably what you see on Patreon because uh, they are hired by companies to do uh, work. Uh, usually they work on Godot and things for companies. Uh, also, uh, we had the grant from Microsoft last year and we're trying to renew it last year. So Ignacio can keep working on C-sharp support like full time. 
uh, that, that would be pretty awesome. Uh, so in general, well, we, we, we have a few contributors. Usually the, the, the logic is that uh, if there are contributors that were able to, to contribute a lot and do significant, significant contributors, contributions in the past, and we, we could like take the advantage of them uh, working full time for the project because not every contributor like would like to work full time for the project. They are fine part time, many of them. Uh, if this situation happens and arises and we can hire them, then that, that's fantastic. Uh, it's not as common as it seems. Like, uh, like for example, we're hiring Thomas now, uh, who is like working uh, on OpenGL DS2 and uh, and on, on his amazing work with GD Native, which is really, really amazing. Uh, and he's working for now. The idea is that he works a full year for us because he's maybe changing careers and being, doing things like that. So in the middle, he's like spending a year. So the idea is that uh, if the situ situation arises, we have enough uh, money to to hire contributors uh, to work more time. Our, our hope is to have like more money than contributors in the sense that if the need arises, we can hire somebody and not just trust try to hire somebody just for the sake of it, uh, because that doesn't really help that much in general. Right. Uh, we just try to uh, use the money as wisely as possible, uh, which is also why why we uh, hire Remy as, as our latest hire. Uh, he, he's been doing like an amazing work as a project uh, coordinator and manager. Uh, so the idea was just he can do it even more because we have a growing amount of contributors and every new release we make uh, that, that kind of duplicates every time. Uh, so at some point, uh, he, his job was uh, better as full time. So we're just trying to First, find the need for somebody uh, to, to to work full time, and then see how we can finance it. Not not the the opposite, because uh, otherwise it's just. Uh, I mean, I feel I would like waste people's money or something like that. It's just trying to make it as responsibly as possible. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thanks, Juan. So the other thing that we have just done, if you guys have seen me looking down here, I'm looking at my laptop. I've been looking at Patreon, but I've also just hit the button on a new pledge level for our Kickstarter. So what we've decided to do, people are saying, can you not support the community a bit more or can you not support Godot a bit more? So what we're doing is at £55, this gift to Godot level, we're going to give all of your pledge, 100% of your pledge to Godot through the, uh, what's the correct channel, Juan? Let's have a look. The open, so let me get the right, the uh, Software Freedom Conservancy. So I'm uh, gonna, yeah. if you back at 55, we're going to give you the all the benefits of what is it? The, the indie, indie package, the 45 pound package. Yeah, the, the 45 pound indie bundle. It may be different in your currency. You're going to get all of that. We're going to give you that as Game Dev TV. We're going to give you all those seven courses for free. We're also going to pay any Kickstarter fees because if you back at 55 pounds or whatever that is in your currency, it doesn't come through to us like that. We get Kickstarter to take some money off. We're going to cover all that. And we're just going to give the total of everything that's backed at the Godot gift level or gift for Godot it's called at that level we're just going to give all that money to to the Godot engine to support them through the software conservancy so for example if 160 something of you are just calculating were to do that then that would get Godot from where they are to their 9,000 pound a month next uh, goal for the next year that would plug that gap for a whole year so go ahead guys let's uh, let's see if we can support them uh, it's going to cost us everybody who backs but I don't mind because we're supporting a good thing so there's that and uh, Jan if you want to keep fielding the questions I'll go back down to the computer and, and keep an eye on things yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. So I've got a lot of questions about specific bugs and issues, and I can see Remy is fielding a lot of those. Just fair warning, guys, I am not prioritizing those. Uh, I'm sure one is very well suited to do that, but I feel that this is a great opportunity to ask the, the sort of larger questions. Um, that said, here's a question from Mehmet. Um, what do you think of Apple's decision to not support OpenGL on Mac and iOS anymore? Do you have any strong opinions on that, or does it not bother you? Uh, I guess it was to be expected. I, I don't think it's a problem that they don't support OpenGL. Uh, what a bit sad is that they don't really want to support Vulkan. Yeah. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why they want that route. It's not like uh, Microsoft, which you can understand that uh, Windows is a very important gaming platform and uh, they want to be on the edge by having their own API. And on the same time, they allow drivers to like support Vulkan OpenGL. So in that sense, it's okay. But I don't really know why Apple... Uh, focuses so much on Metal. Uh, actually, uh, from people that programmed it, uh, I heard it's a really, really nice API for working on 3D, and it's very well done. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I don't know. I really wish they did support. But now that the the, the guys from Valve very, very nicely purchased uh, and are still continuing development and financing of Molten BK, 
uh, it will be possible for us to uh, support it, Apple much better. Uh, you can see from the upcoming versions of uh, Metal that Apple at least is doing a very really nice effort in trying to add the features needed for uh, to Metal, so uh, Molten BK runs nicely on it. So mm -hmm. in the end, I think that's pretty well. That, that's pretty good, I think. Yeah. As long okay. as we can keep using open APIs, it's great. I will be, to me, it will be terrible that we have to end up using proprietary APIs to make an open source game engine. But uh, if Apple keeps in this direction, I think it's it's still good. Yep, that makes sense. Sorry, I'm just answering questions in chat at the same time. Uh, all right, I said I wouldn't do many of these, but here's a question from Amit, which I'm a little interested in. Um, do you think Godot will ever support multi-window support in editor? So can I have Godot here and here, or do I have to open two instances? Oh, yeah, it's, it's as always, it's a, it's a matter of priorities. Yeah. Uh, actually, that is one of the main reasons why uh, we were discussing going Godot 3.2 uh, for Godot 4. Mm -hmm. uh, because if we add this feature, it definitely means breaking compatibility uh, because many things will probably have to work a little different. Uh, uh, so that, that's uh, one of the reasons uh, we, we were thinking of doing a split. We, we have now just a giant object call, called OS, which abstracts operating system functions. And the idea is to split it uh, between display and operating system. So all the display stuff goes in there. And then we will add uh, multiple windows support in there. So that, that's kind of the plan. The one working on this is is, is her Peter Monbram, uh, TMM for for the the nick on the handle. Uh, he's doing this work and probably it's going to be finished by the next version. Uh, and that will probably allow doing uh, this uh, of moving windows out and things like that. that that's a very very re requested feature. Yep. Uh, one of the main reasons also why this wasn't done before is that. Uh, by design, we wanted to prioritize uh, that Godot can be used as best as possible uh, in a single window, uh, because a lot of guys go to jams and, and work on their laptops, and, and they don't have the multi-monitor setups for doing programming. Uh, and I've heard from them that uh, using tools like Unity and Unreal is a bit complicated because they, you have to like use different layouts and things like that uh, to organize their stuff. And Godot was always built on the philosophy that uh, like all the tools will appear on context. Uh, so you, for example, want to edit a tile set then you click the tile set node and the tile set editor appears. Uh, if you click on the animation node, the animation tools appear. Uh, it's usually all very contextual. Uh, yeah. So you usually focus on what you are doing, which makes it work pretty good with the smaller screens. Uh, also, if you look at the, at the inspector, even the new inspector, uh, it's designed so it works like very well in compact size. Uh, when you look, for example, at, at unit users that make the inspector really wide, uh, this is kind of a hassle in in uh, if you have an, a notebook computer or something like that. So we really put all our focus then uh, before all else that it works really, really well as a single window application. Uh, and then after that is more or less as best as possible. The idea was to move to to multi multiple window support. Uh, so we, we don't like get spoiled by doing what others do and then ruin what we were doing or something like that. We just try to get it perfectly as, as we have it now. Yep. Uh, and then the idea was it's going to add the multiple windows support. Uh, also, there were, as always, more priorities. Uh, oh. So uh, the nice thing now is that uh, since the, the amount of contributors keeps growing, uh, more things can be done in parallel. Like if you, if you look at the... Uh, Godot 3 version release, uh, you will see that maybe like 30% uh, of the of the new features were done by me and the rest by our contributors. Uh, and Godot 3.1, I'm probably going to be like lower in the percentage uh, because there's more and more features done by other contributors uh, in comparison, I mean, in, in so now more things and more and more are, are done in parallel. It means more people doing things at the same time. like. As I, as I mentioned, there's type GScript. I think that's going to be one of the ma major features. Uh, but but yes. as, always, as, I, as I was saying, it's just a matter of priorities and amount of people that can work in the features. That makes sense. Uh, going back to what you're saying about the context, I know when Mikey, Michael Bridges from um, Game Dev, us, I forgot the name of the company I work for. I'm a professional. Here's a toucan. Um, when Michael was going through it for the first time, we asked him, can you try and import things into Blender? Would like to write a guide. The first thing he said was, I love how it only shows me what I need to know. Like you don't see thousands of windows unless you ask for them. 
So I really like the way it's optimized for a small screen. I hope one day it's also optimized for multiple screens, but it's, it's a really nice compact engine. Um, just to let people know and remind them, uh, one of the reasons we're doing this, not the only reason, is we've got a Kickstarter. We're in the final week of our Kickstarter, and we want to take this amazing engine, which I've completely fallen in love with, and Ben's fallen in love with, and Michael's now fallen in love with, and make a huge course for it. Now, if the Kickstarter doesn't fund, it's going to fund. But if it doesn't fund, we're making a smaller course for it, like a 15, 20-hour course. But I want to make a 50-hour course. I want to dedicate myself full-time for a, a year, year and a half, and just get as much out as possible, Ben part-time. So that's what part of what we're doing. We also wanted this great opportunity to talk to Juan and then uh, later Remy and later Lars, and we've got some great chats coming for the rest of the week. So if you can, and if you're interested, uh, please back us on the Kickstarter. Uh, we're very happy to support this engine and I'd really wanna see what you guys can make with it. I also wanna see what you guys are making with the um, game jam. Sometimes I forget words and I do dances. Uh, but enough of me wittering, they didn't come to listen to me. A uh, question from 3R ton, 30 ton, 30 ton. Um, what does Juan feel are the biggest weak areas that need better design in Godot? So what do you think the biggest weakness of Godot is right now? Mm, that, that's a good question. Actually, we, we've been working the past three years in fixing what was weak. Uh, so I feel there's less and less weak areas. Uh, I think one of the weakest areas right now was uh, animation because it hasn't changed in like 10 years. Uh, so that was uh, luckily uh, now uh, the, the regular animation editor is, is, is all brand new now. It's, if you have been following my progress on, mm -hmm. on Twitter or, or on the Godot website, I put, I put an article showing all the new, new stuff. Uh, you'll see that that has improved a lot. Uh, the next... Uh, thing that needs to be fixed is the uh, animation tree with the blending and we're going to add the state machine for animation with oh, root motion nice. and things like that which, which is one of the big, big features missing if you missing if you compare uh, Godot with Unreal or Unity uh, that, that's going to be added for 3.1. Uh, I think honestly I think it needs more polish uh, in general. Uh, if you look at something like Unity, Unity is a lot more polished in general mm. and they, they have people working on every little thing and every little detail and everything. Uh, I think Godot has the, the strength of a, of a really, really good core design, uh, which if, if you look at it and uh, from this perspective, it did allow uh, a lot less people uh, with a lot less time to make something like the same as the big engines uh, with, with a lot less resources. I think this is done thanks to a really good core design. That, that's probably one of the biggest strengths because it's really impressive to see so, such a few amount of people make something so complex in comparison to companies that have millions and billions to invest. Uh, we are like catching up faster than they add new things, so it's pretty cool. Yep. But we really need to focus on fixing what is, is there and making more making it more user-friendly. Uh, thankfully, a lot of contributors do that as contributions, as PRs. Uh, like they have easier ways to do stuff all the time. But I think uh, the core developers need to focus on that a lot more. Uh, if you look at Atropation, uh, we have a uh, uh, besides the the, I mean the the, um, you you can like uh, suggest uh, new features and tutorials and thing, and even if only the patrons votes get the counted uh, for what's going to be done, uh, which we try to do like on our free time or between releases or in, for those worried and worried doesn't take so much time from us, uh, but. Uh, if you look at the at the, we always post the um, the popular the I mean the, the popular uh, results like that everyone posts the results and we don't just count the patrons but everyone uh, and that's a very very good feedback I think of what is missing and what is weakest like for example uh, a lot of people complain that uh, compared to Game Maker uh, if you want to make a, a tile set uh, and use a tile set. It's really difficult to do in Godot because we don't have an easy to use tool. Uh, the way you can do it now is super, super flexible, uh, but it's not very uh, easy because you have to make a scene with nodes and then explore a tile set. It's kind of a hassle. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for example, if you just want to make a simple pixel art game, having a simple system where you just put a texture, splice the tile sets, and just draw the collisions or just use preset collisions, I think like that would be very, very uh, nice. Uh, you can actually get uh, add-ons from the uh, from Asset Library for for this if you really need them. Uh, it's not that there isn't any way to do it. 
Uh, but a way that just comes with Godot, probably that, that would be nicer for us as an entry level tool or things like that. Uh, if you look at what people ask there, I think that's the best uh, thing you, you can see that is missing, I, I believe. Juan, I've just gone back to on um, popular request in the chat to shaking your uh, avatar picture in time with your voice, which is uh, wearing out the hole in my hand, which I got from falling on coral in uh, in Sardinia the other day. But that's fine. It shows you're never overqualified for any given particular job. So I will be a pro uh, JPEG shaker. Um, there is a question here from Obo, one of our fantastic moderators. Hey, welcome. Thanks for joining us, which is about the future of visual scripting. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw. Uh, I'm going to dream for a second in a very hand wavy way, literally, and then maybe Juan can tell me why that's impossible and uh, why we'll never get there. But this is what I'd love to see. Is there a future in visual scripting? Look, I use Blueprint in Unreal Engine and I really quite like it. In fact, now you've hardly even got a performance detriment for using it. And if you refactor your code properly, I think that you can express your ideas in visual scripting very well. I think that the thing that when Sam and I discussed this that holds it back a little bit from textual scripting is two or three things. Uh, one is the version control, although you can do visual diffs now on, on the uh, Blueprint in Unreal. So that is possible. It is possible to do visual diffs between uh, visual scripts. So the other thing is um, something about the understanding of execution flow and data flow. So in a Unreal Blueprint, you have white lines and blue lines for execution and data flow. And uh, however well you restructure your project, very quickly, this, this gets a little bit confusing and difficult to visualize. What I hope is that one day we will be doing visual scripting in VR. I hope that I will have up here my main game loop physically above my head and that I'll be able to see the execution flow going around. I'll be able to visualize data flow in size in terms of the thickness of pipes of data that is flowing and dive in and out in a very three-dimensional and hierarchical way. So uh, sounds good. Very easy to wave your hands about, Juan. Uh, how hard would that be to actually do in reality? And do you think it could be beneficial if we could crack it? Wow, that would be really strange. Uh, <laughs> I would, regarding visual scripting, uh, I think the... The, the issue with it is that many users asked, asked for it. Uh, so I did an initial implementation of it. Uh, it only took one month. It was mostly to, to see what was possible to do. Uh, it works. But uh, since then, we got a lot of feedback of, of things that users would like to, to have. The other problem with visual scripting is that a lot of users that come from uh, like platforms like Construct or Unreal Blueprint and everything, they find GScript that is really easy. So they just switch to GScript. And there's not that many uh, people really wanted to use visual scripting. There's a few that remain that just don't want to touch code no matter what. But most people coming from visual platforms just uh, switch to GScript. So that, that's mostly the reason that there's not that many uh, users. But I understand that there's people that can only program this way. And this is really important also for us. Uh, but as I mentioned, the, the thing is, is priorities. I would love to keep working on business scripting, but there's always like things that get more priorities. So I always hope that more contributors can jump in and, and help. Uh, I think probably at this point, business scripting is kind of a redesign. Uh, I think the core idea works, uh, but for example, some things like having separate functions uh, probably would be better to just have one giant uh, thing where you can connect all the nodes, but that's probably more entry level uh, friendly. Mm. Uh, and there, like instead of, on, or for example, just picking a lot of uh, nodes and putting them together you know, in, into a single node so you can just dive in and see what's inside and things like that. that that's more more uh, friendly to, to newcomers, which is probably the, yeah, the aim of, of visual scripting. Uh, I, I would love to work my cell phone on this because I made the original implementation. Uh, I'm kind of like out of time. Uh, once all that is done and working and refactor, then it, it should be fun to do things like editing it in VR or anything like that. Uh, the, the editor plugin API for for God is is pretty flexible now, so it maybe it can be it can be done with a plugin. I I don't really see why not. Yeah, uh, I think and, Ben should make it. He's got this vision for it. Ben, code it. Uh, I had a feeling somebody'd be saying that. Okay, <laughs> I'm also going to speak to Tim Sweeney at Unreal about the idea. I mean, hopefully the world will club together, and it'd be great if we could create something reusable that, that, that could be used in multiple engines. But uh, you know, people get all excited about ownership, so that may be a bit of a pipe dream. Um, yep, you're right. I may have to credit myself, Jan. You're quite right. <laughs> it's more, it's not just this putting things together. It's visualizing data and execution flow and where bottlenecks are. I've kind of got this idea it may work, but it's going to be a lot of work to put it together. So what I'm hoping is that I can wave my hands at somebody really competent and they'll go off and make it happen without me having to actually get my my, my hands dirty. Well, on the, 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 the thing, I used to teach public speaking for a living. Um, on the subject of visual scripting, question here from Fosseguten. 
Foss, I hope that's how you pronounce your name. I've never known. Very active in our Discord and very big supporter. Are you adding, or I guess re-adding, visual script for shaders soon? Oh yeah, that's coming back in the next little version. Uh, but I have to work on that after my 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 schedule right now is uh, I need to finish the new animation systems and all the animation stuff. Uh, then I need to get back uh, uh, visual shaders. Uh, and then from my part, I, I should be like done for the next little version. Uh, of course, the other contributors need to finish their, their own stuff too. Uh, so it's not just me. Yep. But uh, that, that's my next uh, thing after I finish animation. Awesome. Guys, I think what we're going to have to do is start winding this up because I'm really scared that if people see a replay YouTube video that's over one hour long, that they're not even going to start watching it and then they'd miss out on all of the great value that Juan has brought us today. So Juan, is there anything else on, on parting you'd like to share with everybody before we say thank you very much and, and move on? Oh, yes. First of all, I, I want to thank you and I need to thank Jan uh, for, for doing this. Uh, I think it's very important. I think the Kickstarter is very important because uh, you, I think we, we have improved a lot of our documentation. Uh, the work that GD Quest has been doing has also been great. Mm -hmm. But we still need a, a lot more work and we, we, we lack professional uh, educators like you guys uh, who understand how to actually make uh, documentation that is uh, how, how you can say like more fit for everybody. Uh, you understand that how you understand how to make that. Uh, we don't. We we do our best on making tutorials and recite feedback. Uh, so your contribution, I think, is is very important for this. Uh, even if there is more material, people can can get on on, on other sites and say, I think your the work you're doing is very important. Uh, and also, thanks for adding this uh, new pledge for for the Kickstarter. Uh, we'll make sure everybody knows about it because it is very cool. Yeah, the 55, well, I'm glad to say a whole bunch of people have already jumped on the 55 pound pledge. So that's where, and the, please don't jump on it in too many masses because every time you do it, costs, it's going to cost us to give you the course and pay the Kickstarter fees. But I'm kind of being, I'm kind of being facetious. I'm very happy to further support Godot. So do slam the 55 pound mark. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, honestly, the reason why we're putting so much effort into this is because we believe in it. I mean, if we were just in this for the money, frankly, we would stick to Unreal and Unity because those are very popular courses. And we want to do those, and they're great fun. Those are great engines. But Godot is a great engine, and we think now is its time. This yeah. is a great time to support Godot. So, guys, spread the word. If you can afford to pledge, pledge. If you can afford to up your pledge, we really appreciate it. And if you can't, and you can throw us a pound, or you just want to give us moral support and spread the word, we really appreciate that. Everything yeah. helps. Let's get this engine to as many people as we can because that way, two or three years time, we'll start seeing some incredible games made by Gala. And I want to just mention two more things. So thank you very much to Jan, my old friend. Jan, we've been friends since we were like 10 years old. We hey. go back a long way. Awesome to have you back in the country, mate. See you tomorrow. Right. Um, yeah, I'm in England. I want to thank you for your enthusiasm and independence on this Godot thing. We, this wouldn't be happening without you doing it, the, the, just taking the reins of this horse. So you rock, I've got to say that. To those of you back in the Kickstarter, remember you can back not on a pledge level, but it's slightly above a pledge level. The £55 one in your currency is called the Godot gift. Is that right, Yen? It's going to be different yeah. in people's different gift currency. The gift, gift for Godot. Uh, it's going to be different in different currencies. But remember, you can back at 56 or 57 or 10 or 15 or 11. It doesn't matter. You'll always just get the benefits of the, of the, of the reward below. So if you can all back your, up your pledges by 20%, might only cost you a couple of dollars, uh, make all the difference. That would be great. Um, just thank you to everybody. You've all been awesome. And in future live streams coming up later in the next seven or eight days, there's going to be all sorts of exciting new information about other aspects of this. And you'll be hearing from other cool members of the Godot community. So. And before we go any further, I should point this out. Level GD has mentioned this. Uh, we haven't mentioned any of the games out from Godot. He specifically mentioned, I think it's a he, she, they, I don't know. Uh, check out the visual novel Order Road, which I haven't personally checked, but I've heard great things. There's some amazing games being made and out. In fact, there was one... Um, about Wizards Fighting, the name of which I, I forget, came out on Steam today. Support the games out there if you can afford to. There's uh, some transmogrifying Kickstarter, looks really fun. Back the games, keep the word out. Keep the word out? Yeah, that's an expression. That'll do, keep it out, yeah, and keep the word, keep the word <laughs> away from the door. Juan, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. We're going to end before the hour gets up. So uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Keep an eye on the uh, on the uh, comments of the Kickstarter because we're going to be releasing more live streams. We're going to have another five, four or five over the next uh, over the next week. So great. Thank you. And see you all very thank you. soon. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining us. And thank you, Juan. See you, guys. Thank you very much. Now I've got to find where the button is to stop this, the stream. So this is where everybody sees me fumbling with OBS. If I just kill OBS, that should do it.